Hi, my name is Matthew Kavanagh. I teach uh, A-level politics and history here at Cardinal Newman College. And today I'm just going to be delivering a short presentation to let you know what to expect if you choose to study A-level politics at Cardinal Newman College. So without further ado, let's get going. I thought I'd start at the end, if you like, with how would the course be examined? So the exam is in the uh, second year, as you can see, at the end of the second year, okay? And our examination board is AQA. So it's what we call a linear qualification, AQA, A-level politics, and the exam is at the end of the two years. Of course, that won't be the first time you see exam questions. We will be um, using past exam questions as uh, assessment points in the year and also we'll plan exam questions in lessons but just so you know the ultimate form of assessment is an exam at the end of your second year how many exams are there well there's three exam papers as you can see here uh, one for each unit uh, i'll tell you about what the three units are shortly but just so you know there's three exam papers one for each unit and each exam will be two hours okay and in that two hours you'll be expected to do a mixture of short answer questions so these are nine mark questions so each paper has three nine mark questions on it okay um, and then there's also on section b a longer extract based question which is 25 marks which is where you'll be given a piece of political writing and asked to analyze and evaluate the arguments in it and lastly Section C, um, they're 25 mark essay questions. You pick one question from a choice of two. Don't be daunted by that. As I say, um, we will do a lot of preparation throughout the two years to get you ready for that point. But just so you're aware how it's examined. OK. So let me take you through the first unit or the first paper. You would study this um, in your year 12 so we will begin with this paper and it takes up most of your year 12 your first year up until about easter of your first year okay and yeah the title of the unit is uk government and politics so let me tell you a little bit about what that means we'll start with government first of all so government is how the country is run basically very simply so we will look at the people who are in government who help to run the country and in a sense the people who who are in charge of our daily lives and what we can do and what we can't do so the laws that are passed the way those laws are implemented or how policy is carried out and what happens if there's a dispute about those laws or that policy okay so we start off by looking at something called the British Constitution. OK, so a constitution is a set of rules about how a country is to be run. Britain's constitution is quite strange in that it wasn't written down all at one time. And some bits of it aren't written down at all. Some bits of it are based on what we call convention, which is expected behaviour or norms of behaviour. Some of it is based on what we call common law, which is decisions made by judges in cases that are followed similarly in the following cases. And some of it is based on what we call statute law, which is laws passed by Parliament. So we will take an in-depth look at the British Constitution, at the rules that are used to govern us. OK, basically the set of rules about how our country should be run. We'll analyse that, what is good about it what could be criticised about it, how could it be improved, how has it changed over time. Okay, then the next thing we would look at uh, under UK government would be Parliament. So I've just circled there the Westminster Palace, which is where that Houses of Parliament are in the United Kingdom, that's in London. Okay, and yeah, it's made up of two parts, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It's what we call the legislative body. So the body that makes our laws. So again, we will look at, right, well, how do you, who's in the House of Commons? Who's in the House of Lords? What powers does each chamber have? 
how do you get there? Again, how good at it? How good is it at passing laws? How good is it at scrutinising the work of the government, which is its job? How good is it at representing the people, me and you, the voters, which is its other job? Okay, then we'll move on to um, what we call the executive branch or the government. Okay, and that is basically, as you've circled there, the prime minister and his or her cabinet. Currently, our Prime Minister, as you can see there, and as you probably know, is Boris Johnson. So we would look at what what is the role of the Prime Minister? How has it evolved over the years? What power does the Prime Minister have? How much does the individual personality of the Prime Minister affect um, how the country is run? Um, we'll also look at what we call the Prime Minister's Cabinet, which are the key advisors um, to the Prime Minister that run the various government departments, so for example health, education, the Home Office. How does the Cabinet work? How does the Prime Minister interact with their Cabinet? Do they, some Prime Ministers have lent on their Cabinet quite a lot and uh, it really is a collective government where they work closely with the Cabinet. Other Prime Ministers have kind of sidelined their Cabinet, rode roughshod over them. Um, so yeah, the Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister's office is really what the holder makes of it. So we will look at how that role has evolved and how the um, different office holders have uh, used it, particularly since 1979. So we're basically going to go from Margaret Thatcher all the way up to Boris Johnson in the present day, taking in Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, John Major, etc, etc. The other branch of government we look at before we move on to politics is the, the judiciary okay the judiciary is the court system they're the ones who resolve disputes about the law apply the law interpret the law and we don't this isn't this is a politics course it's not a law course so we don't look at the entire judiciary but as you can see from the picture I've circled we will look at the Supreme Court the Supreme Court um, was created by a piece of legislation in 2005 or a law in 2005 and it began its work in 2009 and it interacts quite a lot with the political branches with parliament and with the executive sometimes ruling that things that parliament and the executive have done ruling them to for example to be against human rights or what we call ultra vires where a member of the executive or the government has gone beyond the powers given to them by law. So the Supreme Court interacts with politicians a lot, hence is politically relevant. So while this isn't a law course, we will look at how politicians interact with the judiciary, the Supreme Court. And again, we'll look at the evolution of the Supreme Court, where it came from, what was there before, what powers does it have, what can't it do? And again, what's good about it, what's bad about it. OK, so that's the government side of the course. Moving on to the politics side of the course. OK, politics is about the distribution of power in a society. So who gets what, when and how. So the government um, decides who gets what, when and how. But how do we decide who is in government and how is pressure brought to bear on government to try and change their decisions? Well, that's through politics. So if you like, government is about politicians, politics is about people. So the most basic way that people interact with politics is they vote. OK, so we will look at uh, voting behaviour. OK, so how and why do diff different groups of people tend to vote the way that they do? Voting behaviour has become a lot more complex and a lot more volatile over the years. So we will look at the factors that shape voting behaviour and why people vote the way they do. Similar to that, there's a module called Democracy and Participation. That's how do ordinary people participate in politics. We've already spoke about voting, but voting isn't the only way. People like to join political parties. Some people might join what we call a pressure group. So here we will study pressure groups. Groups like Greenpeace, Shelter, Black Lives Matter, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. How do they put pressure on the government to try and get it to do the things they want it to do? And I've already mentioned political parties as part of democracy and participation. 
but we will study political parties in their own right. So what is the Conservative Party? What is the Labour Party? How long have they been around? How have they evolved? What are their policies? How have they changed over the years? How are they funded? How are their leaders elected? And we'll do the same for what we call third parties and minor parties. So the Liberal Democrats, for example, the Green Party or, and UKIP, which is now, well, is now no more. Well, I think it still exists, but um, yeah, it's become second really to the Brexit Party. But again, we will look at both major and minor parties, uh, their ideas, their organisation and their funding. Last but not least, we will look at Britain's relationship with the European Union. Obviously, we have left the European Union. Now, Brexit is now uh, complete, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, the European Union will cease to have influence on our politics. If any of you are watching the news at the moment, you will see that there's currently an argument going on between Britain and the European Union over what we call the Northern Ireland Protocol after Brexit. So, and again, a lot of our laws that uh, we have um, have been, um, well, for a long time, EU law was uh, part of our life. Now, it is no longer part of our life, but a lot of um, EU law has been incorporated into British law now. So again, our relations with the EU are important. Okay, so that's paper one. We'll move on now to paper two or unit two. We're going to do the same thing basically as we do for paper one, but we're going to do it looking at the United States of America, and then we're going to compare the two. So again, we'll go a lot quicker through this slide, but we will look at US government. So how the U United States of America is run. We will look at the United States Constitution. It is quite different to our Constitution in that it is what we call codified, all written down in one place at one time. Very few amendments since then. So 230 years old, I think, and only uh, 27 amendments have been made. But again, we'll look at the rules that are set down by the US Constitution. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, we will do the comparative bit where we will compare the US Constitution to the UK Constitution. What are the similarities? What are the differences? What effect does that have? What are the relative strengths and weaknesses? We will look at the US legislative branch or the lawmaking branch, which is called Congress, made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Again, we will look at Right, what powers does it have? How does it pass laws? And then again, you'll learn to compare it to the UK, its strengths, its weaknesses, what's similar, what's different. We will look at the US presidency. That is the executive branch in the United States of America. OK, that's the one that's in charge of implementing the laws that are passed and running the country. OK, and again, you'll learn to look at the evolution of the office of president, how it's changed over the years and the different how the different office holders have used it. Going back from probably to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s, all the way up to Joe Biden in the present day. Um, how has that office evolved over the years? How much power does it have? And again, you'll be able to compare it to the United Kingdom prime minister. What are their relative powers? What are their relative strengths and weaknesses? What are the similarities and the differences? We'll look at the judicial branch in the United States. That's what we call the Supreme Court, mostly. The Supreme Court has the power to interpret the Constitution. It can strike laws passed down by Congress. It can strike down laws, uh, sorry, it can strike down actions of the president. So it's quite a lot more powerful than our Supreme Court. We'll look at why that is, how it's evolved. Again, compare it to our Supreme Court, relative powers, strengths, weaknesses, process. Then we'll move on to the politics of the United States. So we'll start, you know, just like we did with the UK, we will look at voting behavior. How and why do people vote the way they do in the United States? What theories are there about that? And we'll compare it to voting behavior in the United Kingdom. Um, we'll look at political parties in the United States, the Republicans and the Democrats, the elephant and the donkey there, the symbols of the Republican and the Democrat parties. Again, uh, what are the ideas of the parties, where do they come from, how have their ideas changed over time, and then we'll compare them to Labour and the Conservatives. We'll also look at the role of third and minor parties in the United States and how does that compare to the role of third and minor parties in the United Kingdom. And we'll also look 
at civil rights and pressure groups in the United States. So you might have heard things like about a group called Black Lives Matter or the National Rifle Association. They're powerful pressure groups in the United States that try to put pressure on politicians to change the law or policy in their favour. Again, we'll look at the uh, evolution of pressure groups in the United States, what power they have, what influence they have, what's good about that, what's bad about that, and we'll compare it to the United Kingdom. So after paper one and paper two, you'll basically have a very clear understanding of how democratic constitutional politics works in both the United Kingdom and the United States, and you'll be able to learn to compare the two. Moving on to the last paper, that's a lot shorter. It's called Political Ideas, paper three, and essentially we look at the theory or the ideas that underpin everything that we've been looking at. So we will look at ideas or ideologies such as liberalism, which is a very influential ideology in the United Kingdom and the United States, and it's based around individual freedom. Um, we'll also look at an ideology called conservatism, which again is an influential one in the United Kingdom and the United States. Conservatism is about wanting to conserve, not to stop change, but to be cautious about change and gives a lot of value to tradition and hierarchy. Okay, and yet we will look at another ideology or political idea called socialism. Okay, which socialism boiled down very simply is, is meant to be about equality. Okay, but again, um, it's been less influential in the United States, more influential in the United Kingdom, but Again, we'll look, you'll learn what it means to be socialist, what have different socialist thinkers said. In fact, for all those uh, ideas, we'll be looking at different thinkers and how those ideas have evolved over time. And crucially, the difference between the ideas in theory and how it's carried out in practice. Last but not least, there's an optional ideology called, uh, we're going to look at anarchism. Anarchism is about the idea of that human beings don't need government. Again, I'm being very simple, simplistic there, but we'll look at how has anarchism evolved? What are the different thinkers and what do they say? What are the different strands of anarchism? And again, has it ever worked in practice? Okay, guys, so having gone over the content, um, a few frequently asked questions that I'm often asked. Okay, so what are the results like? Well, obviously the last two years have been quite different. Um, we've had teacher assessed grades due to COVID-19 because exams have been canceled, but um, if we go back to 2018, 2017, 2016, 2015, I've done you an average of actual exam results and our average A-level results have been over those years 55% uh, A star to B. Okay, so more than half of our students on average over the last few years have received A star A or B grades. 80% have received a star to C grades, A star A, B or C, and then 99% pass rate. That's well above the national average. Does the department run any trips? Yes, we do. We have had a trip to Parliament. Uh, in the past, we've had trips to uh, either the um, People's History Museum in Manchester. None are planned at the moment due to the ongoing pandemic, but as things loosen up, they may well be rearranged. And of course, by the time you start at Cardinal Newman, hopefully, yes, we will be running trips to Parliament in London to the People's History Museum in Manchester again. Um, what are the average class sizes? Well, approximately 22. It varies, but if I was to give you an average, approximately 22. So you've got a larger class size than you would get in a school sixth form. But the flip side of that is you've got an expert A-level teacher who only teaches A-level, uh, in my case, politics and history. Um, and therefore, I'm not having to worry about, you know, getting lessons ready for year seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11 as well. So the class sizes will be bigger than you would get in a school six from, but you will get uh, dedicated A-level teachers teaching you. Um, what are the entry requirements? Well, they're the standard college entry requirements. We want five grade fives, but we do have an additional requirement for politics, uh, which is a six required in English. Uh, it doesn't matter whether that's English literature or English language, but you need to have a six in one of them because there is a lot of reading and a lot of writing involved in this course. Uh, students often say, oh, isn't it just about debating? Well, no, that's a debate club. We do 
obviously debate ideas in class and discuss ideas in class and look at things from different viewpoints but a level politics is not a debating club okay a level politics is the academic study of politics so of course we discuss ideas of course we debate different theories but it's not just about saying what you think you also have to learn how to write uh, an argument in a logical essay you have to learn to be able to read political texts so it is important that you have those basic english requirements and we do require a six in either english language or english literature but other than that it's just your standard a level entry requirements five grade fives last but not least what career paths are open to politics students well there's a wide range basically if you learn to study politics you'll learn to analyze things from different viewpoints uh, you will learn about how laws are made you will learn about how policy is made and that is useful in a wide range of careers so uh, we've had students going to work in public administration or the civil service we've had students going to teaching the media business administration marketing accountancy law it's a great grounding the skills that you will get in politics to be able to understand how the country works uh, and also to be able to analyze things from different points of view and create an argument they are skills that are vital in so many different careers hopefully that's answered any questions that you would have about a level politics at cardinal newman but if you have any further questions please just contact us through teams through you could send uh, questions to the uh, admissions office through teams or to marketing through teams or you can email me at m kavanagh i'll write that down for you m kavanagh at that k a v a n a g h at cardinal newman all one word dot ac dot uk and i'll be happy to answer any questions you have thanks very much for your attention and hopefully we'll be seeing you in a politics class before too long bye now